Less than 24 hours from now, we're going to have a whole group of kids that are going to come through the doors of our church. We have an opportunity to reach them with the most significant thing that they can receive in their lives, and that is the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to give you some statistics. I'm, not going, to, I'm, going, to, I'm going to abbreviate my sermon here. I don't want to give you some statistics because I think this is important. Um, these are very recent statistics. I'm going to start that. 60% of our churches did not baptize one person between the ages of 12 and 17. That's the group that was up here. Okay? Not one. 80% of our churches did not baptize anyone between the ages of 18 and 29. 25% of our churches did not reach one person with the gospel of Jesus Christ this last year. Last year, our denomination had the worst drop in baptisms ever, and this year we're already on track for 1.5% lower than we were this time last year. And about 500 churches are closing their doors every month. That's 6,000 churches a year closing the doors and walking away. That's when our population is growing by leaps and bounds. All right, stop there for a second. In five, we have five days to make an impact with these kids that are coming. Five days to, to change their lives, perhaps, for all eternity. Five, five days. I want you to grasp, grasp the importance of that, the gravity of that. Every time one of our churches closes their doors and walks away, Satan rejoices. And you need to hear this. It's not the pastor's responsibility to reach the community for Christ. It's not the pastor's responsibility to do that. It's the church's responsibility. And who is the church? Raise your hand if you're the church. Okay, there you go. You see, that responsibility has been given by God to His church. Yet, next statistic, 90% of, of people who claim to be evangelicals have never, ever, ever, never, ever shared their faith with anyone. Next slide. 90, 95% of the church growth in the United States is transfer growth, church hopping. People changing from one church to another church. What does this say? This says that we're not reaching the population. Here's, here's another startling statistic. I don't have it on the screen. 85% of our community is unchurched. That means they, they have no affiliation whatsoever with any church anywhere. This is an interesting graphic, isn't it? See, we're simply not reaching the people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> And it's pretty amazing because it really isn't that hard. This isn't like some formula that we've got to that we've got to somehow, you know, go to seminary for three years and get a degree in order to do that. I want us to read something. I want us to read something. I love to read mystery novels. Okay, but I have to tell you that I cheat. When I was a boy, my parents every month we had the, like the book of the month club. They got me the entire the entire series of Hardy Boy Mysteries. Some of you have no clue what that is. It's okay. But every month I would get a new Hardy Boys mystery. And I will tell you that I tore open the package as soon as it came and I would begin reading it. But shortly after I began reading it, I would flip to the very back of the book because I wanted to see how it ended. And that made the story a whole lot more fun for me. Well, I got news for you. I've also read the back of this book and I know how it ends but between now and, the, and how it ends there's a lot of work 
that has to be done. And I want to read you something out of the back of this book because it's going to give us a clue as to how we can give Satan a one-two knockout punch. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> it says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers. Who is the accuser of our brothers? Satan has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Here it is. And they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Let me read that verse again. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Who are they in that? That's us. That's the church. That's the army of the Lord. You know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, we used to sing militant songs. We used to talk about being soldiers in the army of the Lord. We, we have a video that we show to Awanas. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. But we don't do that in church. Somehow we've gotten to become passive in our understanding of, our, of who our enemy is. When I was a kid, we'd sing, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, but I'm in the Lord's army. We used to sing, onward Christian soldiers. We don't sing those kind of songs anymore. Somewhere along the way, we redefine the mission of the church. We're more interested in gathering an audience than building an army. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. I've always been curious about that verse, because for me, that verse makes it sound like that that I should be able to raise people from the dead and heal the sick. Let me tell you, let me give you a clue about that. You have power. The Holy Spirit resides within you. We don't have to invite the Holy Spirit to come in. The Holy Spirit is here. If you're here and you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is in this place. But if you and you and you and you and you and you and I get together and we lock arms, and we go out to fight the enemy greater than even what Jesus did by himself will we do. Nothing can stop the church that's on the move. Nothing. Nothing can stop the church that's on the move. So, the church gathered, when we gather here, spiritual combat training takes place. This is where the pastor's responsibility and the other spiritual leaders of the church. It's our responsibility to train you. We're in the basic training and advanced individual training cadre. Okay? Cadre. However you pronounce that word. Okay? But then, once we get trained and equipped and we get renewed and energized, then we become the church that's scattered. If you read the book of Acts, there was... God had to bring... God had to bring a, a, a terrible situation on the church in order to get them out of the building. And they became persecuted. And it says that they all went out and everywhere they went, they proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. The only place that it didn't take place was in Jerusalem. By the church building. But when they went out there, they began to do what they were called to do. The battle takes place not in the church building, but in the world. We have the tools that we need, and it's in that verse. The first one of these, look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Here it is. Give me verse 11. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. First one, it's only a two-point sermon. The first one of the way we can give Satan his one-two punch. Here's punch number one. The blood of the Lamb. Why is that? Satan is an accuser. And he reminds us of our sin all the time. But you know what? If you're 
a child of God, then your sin is covered by the blood of the Lamb. It's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. But in our politically correct society, we no longer talk about blood. We no longer preach about the blood. Our, most of our choruses that we sing in churches today are devoid of blood talk. We don't like to talk about blood. Blood makes us a little queasy, makes us a little nervous. But you know what? You need to know about the blood because if you're a Christian, it's the only thing that covers your sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is the thing that covers your sin. Okay? <clears throat> when I was a kid, we sang songs like, Washed in the blood of the Lamb, nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. We don't sing those kind of songs anymore. Our choruses are feel-good kind of choruses sometimes. I'm not knocking. Look, I love the praise and worship that we do. And I'm glad to see that they're coming back. We sing a song here. Um, oh, the blood, crimson love. I love that song. We're getting back to singing about that thing that covers our sin. It's the first thing that defeats Satan. You see, as long as Satan can remind you of your sin and convince you that sin is, is, is controlling your life, then, then he has got power over you. We need to break that power. We need to break that power by convincing him, first of all, by convincing ourselves and convincing him that no matter what he has to say to us, it doesn't matter. Because it's been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14 makes it clear. It says this. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. This is a reference to the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls, and with the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, here it is, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from dead works, here it is, to serve the living God. In verse 20. Oh, I'm sorry. The next verse. Read the next verse. Is there not a next verse? Not a next verse. Okay. Verse 22 then. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Let's, let's change that around and make it positive. With the shedding of blood, there is forgiveness of sin. So as Christians, we need to talk about the blood. It's the first punch that we can give to Satan. We proclaim the blood of Jesus. We can proclaim the blood of Jesus over circumstances and situations in our lives. We, we have the privilege and the opportunity to claim the blood of Jesus Christ over those situations that would prevent us from being the church that would prevent us from doing the things that God has called us to do. 1 Peter 1.18 tells us exactly how this happened to you and me and how Satan lost the battle for our souls. It says this, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without spot or blemish. So how is Satan defeated? Point number one, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. Paul declared when he preached that he said, we didn't come preaching you with, with flowery words, but we came preaching Christ and Him crucified, the shedding of blood for the remission of sin. And when he cried, it is finished on the cross, Satan thought he had won, and it was the victory cry for you and for me. And out of nowhere, Jesus landed that first punch to Satan when he cried, it is finished. The spilled blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Knockout punch number two. Here it is. 
by the word of our testimony. Can you think of something significant from your past that you could share right now without having to practice it? Every one of us has, has stories that we can share. The truth is, is the greatest thing that ever happened to you and the greatest thing that ever happened to me is the day that we discovered that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. And yet somehow, someway, we've been convinced that, that, that we can't share that with anybody. We have, to, we have to keep that a secret. But you see, that's Satan working through you because he knows that if you start sharing your testimony, it's going to change people's lives and it's going to cause him to not be able to do the things that he does in the world. So listen, I want to challenge you today. I'm going to, I'm going to bring this to a close here real quick. I want to challenge you today. If you cannot share your testimony with anybody right now, here it is. This is how you do it. How I was before I became a Christian my life before Christ, yes. how I became a Christian, your conversion experience, and how Christ has changed my life after my conversion experience. That's your testimony. If, if, if you need to, I want you to write it down. I'm serious about this. I think every Christian ought to, I ought to be able to point to you and say, can you tell me your testimony? You ought to be able to stand up and tell me that. You can tell me who won the Super Bowl. You can tell me lots of other things that you don't have to practice. But, 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 but we can't share our testimony. It is the very thing, besides the blood of the Lamb, it is the very thing that causes Satan to be completely destroyed. It's the thing that's ultimately going to completely destroy him in the end. Your testimony is powerful. Listen, brothers and sisters, if we're going to be the church, then we need to go out there and we need to share our faith. That, that starts with sharing our testimony. How did Jesus change my life? And if we share that, and, and we've, if you need to practice it, then practice it. Stand, write it down, stand in front of a mirror, practice it over and over to the point that you can say it without having to think about it. It becomes as natural as, as telling us your date of birth or your social security number for you in the military. It becomes that natural, okay? That's the thing, because the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of our testimony, the word of our testimony, It's the thing that's going to cause Satan to flee. You don't have to have a theological education. You don't even have to have a college degree. You, don't have, you just have to have had an encounter with Jesus Christ. That's it. Because when you share your testimony, that's the second punch. Give me that picture again, that sermon title slide. That's the second punch, the final punch to Satan. And knock him out completely. So that's my challenge to you today. It's not everything I wanted to say, but the time is upon us here. That's the important stuff. We were about the time to preach it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> listen. Listen to this. You have been convinced somehow by the enemy that people don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. But I will tell you I will tell you that there are, there are people out there that are dying every single day and going to hell. And these are not nameless, faceless people. These are people that you know. These are people that are family members. These are people that are good friends of yours. These are people that are friends of your children and, the, and, and things like that. It's people that you can name by name because you have failed to share your testimony. We're not talking about... We're not talking about a casual challenge here. We're talking about a life or death situation. The enemy wants you to keep procrastinating on this. He wants you to keep dragging your feet on this. He wants you to say, well, that's not really my thing, you know, Pastor. You know, I don't mind helping in the kitchen, but, you know, it's not my thing to be sharing my faith. I can't do that. If you had a good recipe, ladies, you'd share that. You do it all the time. I read your Facebook posts. Okay, you post the pictures. They make me fat just by looking at them. Okay? You share your stuff all over the place. Share your faith. Amen. Give your testimony. Because it's important enough that, 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 that Jesus, that God said, it's, it's the second part of a one-two knockout punch for Satan. Amen. The blood of the Lamb and the testimony Amen. of those 
The word of their testimony. Put that, put that key verse up there again. That, that verse. This is important. It's that second verse. Look at the last part of that. I don't want to miss this. For they love not their lives, even unto death. What are you willing to give up in order to share your testimony? There are people who have given their, literally given their lives, and there are people every day in, on this planet who are giving up their lives in order to be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, and yet you and I find excuses for walking across the street to share the good news of Jesus Christ. What are you willing to give up? What is it going to take for you to get real? Young people that just went to Kentucky Changers, you just got energized, okay? You just got your battery filled up. This is the best time that you can possibly be in your life to go out there and share your faith with your friends because you've experienced this life-changing experience for yourself afresh and anew. So let's go out there and do that. I love the fact that she said people that have already been should have been dead twice and they're 70 and I'm thinking I'll be 60 in December. I said, that's 70 is not so old. You know how age is a relative thing? Listen, you're never too old to share your faith. You're never too old to share your faith. Here's another one. You're never too young to share your faith. So whatever excuse you're using, throw it in the trash can. Amen. And let's get out there and give Satan the old one too. And let's take this community for Christ. I want to share some things with you after our, after our, te after our uh, uh, invitation time. I've got a couple of things I'm excited about, but we're going to do that invitation time. Just go to the piano. We don't need the singers to go up there. I want you to stand with me. I really want to challenge you. We've got, we've got kids that are coming through our door this week. I think it's important that everybody who's involved in Vacation Bible School be overtly trying to share their faith with these kids on a level that they can understand. Demonstrating that by the things that we say and the things that we do. But more than that, their families need to be reached. We can touch the kids here, but what are we going to do after vacation Bible school is over? We need to go and visit those families. We need to go and share that with them. We need to encourage them. Friday night, this coming Friday night is a family night. Those parents are going to come. You need to be here. You say, I don't have a kid in vacation Bible school. It doesn't matter. Those kids are going to be here, and those parents are going to be here. And this is an opportunity for their, they're not, you don't even have to go to their house. They're going to come to your house. Amen. They're going to come to your house. Come Friday night. What time is that, Miss Renee? Six, Six o'clock. Friday night. Come here Friday night for the family night. And, and then speak to the parents that are here. Talk to them. Share the love of Christ with them. Talk to them about how you were before you became a Christian. How Christ changed your life. And this is the difference that it made. Come and do that. Prepare, be prepared to share your testimony with them. Listen, this is your opportunity to respond. I believe that everybody who is serious about their faith needs to be on their face before God right now, asking God to show you how you can do better at sharing your testimony and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. This is your opportunity. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. If you need to come to the front to pray, if you need to turn and kneel at your chair and pray, Whatever it is that, 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 that you feel like you need to do, but I think it's time for us to renew our commitment to God and say, God, I am going to do my very best with your help to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to share my faith at every opportunity. And then go beyond that and say, Lord, give me opportunity upon opportunity to share my faith. This is so vitally important. People are dying and going to hell because we fail to talk. Because we fail to open our mouths and tell people what God has done for us. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Those statistics are too startling. Too startling. We need to be about this. We need to be doing this. This is so, so vitally important.